Okay, we are live, and I believe we are. So, happy Halloween, everybody, and welcome to the 18th episode of 100 Years of the NFL, a historical journey. Of course, I got the grandfather mask on. I'm certain everyone has enjoyed their Halloween out there, and I am blessed to have uh, two special guests here tonight, fresh off their Halloween weekends, and Samuel Goodell and Billy McGee, how was your Halloween, guys? And uh, are you guys ready to um, talk a little sports tonight? Didn't dress up, Alex, but Halloween was uh, was enjoyable. Got a got a win on Sunday night with the Bills, um, so uh, that's all I needed. Yeah, actually, uh, I went to the Hornets game on Halloween, so that was pretty disappointing. So, <laughs> yep. All right, I'm going to go ahead and take this off then. <laughs> got, a bit of, got a bit of hat hair or mask hair, whatever you want to call it. But tonight's going to be a really, really fun here. We're going to go um, over um, some of the uh, AFC teams, as Sam and um, Billy just mentioned. And we're going to um, hopefully um, delve a little bit um, more into the other sports leagues with Billy and myself later but let's go ahead and jump um right into this though um i'm gonna try and pull up um pro football reference here really quick but going through the halfway point of the season right now of course billy and i um we both met right at the end of the month of september and certainly a lot has changed over the last few weeks but first let's go ahead and talk about on um, the afc east here sans buffalo bills riding high at a six and one record but they have some company at five and three with the Dolphins red hot under to a Tyler Viola. the Jets kind of making a bit of a run at five and three even though losing Brees Hall and of course the Patriots at four and four in the midst of a bit of an identity crisis at quarterback but Sam I'll start with you on um this year Bills six and one obviously fresh off beating Green Bay on Sunday night as you mentioned but in your opinion, how big was that victory for Buffalo over Kansas City a few weeks ago if Buffalo is going to get home field advantage in the playoffs? How do you see that affecting the AFC playoff picture over the second half of the season? Yeah. Um, look, at from, from a fan's perspective, uh, Alex, this was a huge game. You know, you, you want to see – there's not many games this season in the NFL where a really, really good team plays a really, really good team. There's a lot of um, big spreads. There's a lot of mediocrity around the league. So as a fan, you want to see a great offense or a great team, I should say, go against another great team. In terms of importance, of course, there is home field. But at the end of the day, the Chiefs are going to have to beat the Bills or the Bills are going to have to beat the Chiefs gets the Super Bowl. And this doesn't change anything. Look, I know that the, the Jets are 5-3 and three and the Dolphins look like they could be something, but from a Bills fan's perspective or any analytically-minded fan, there's no threat for the Bills making the playoffs. It's all about beating them the second time. And we did the same thing last year. We went to Kansas City just like we did this year. We won convincingly, more convincingly than we did this year, and then we went and we lost them in the divisional round of the playoffs. So – Look, I loved it. It was fun. I got hyped for the game. I love winning against great teams, but practically, it's we'll see him again, and that's the the game that matters the most. If we lose that game, then every argument that Bills fans made on Twitter is is for null. So. And and kind of Billy, my question to you probably just you know kind of seeing the other three teams in the AFC East, as I was just saying about two, a really kind of striking gold um over his last few games after being out with that concussion, we were there um, telecasting that night when Tua got um, concussed really severely that night when you said his hands were um, kind of like, yeah, right like his up. hands tensed up. Yeah. You could see the hands contort there. But my feeling to you is this, just kind of asking this question, kind of seeing how the Jets performed last week without Brees Hall against New England. Do you think Miami is probably the clear um, favorite to maybe get in second place and perhaps a oh lot by of far hard bit in that division. Yeah, Zach Wilson isn't a good quarterback, so I wouldn't be scared of the Jets. No. Like he might be the worst starting quarterback in the league. I agree. Mm-hmm. He's four and one. His decision making <laughs> is terrible. I agree. I agree. Great. Yeah, they're winning games. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're winning games. They have a really good defense and a good running game, but their mm-hmm. quarterback is not good. Mm-hmm. It's been a long question mark for Jets quarterbacks ever since they got rid of Chad Pennington. And then that one year they had Brett Favre before they drafted Mark Sanchez in 2009. It's been a long time for them to have some consistency there. Let's move on, though, um, to um, the AFC North division here really quick here. This has been kind of a toss-up division for most of um, this season. Baltimore has kind of finally pulled away with a 5-3 and three record and just recently at the trade deadline um, traded for Roquan Smith on the Chicago Bears here. I'm going to defer this question to um, Billy here on the AFC North here. Of course, Cincinnati without Jamar Chase for another um, few weeks here, but, you know, kind of as I were talking about this before, you know, do you think Cincinnati and Baltimore is going to go all the way down to the finish? Or do you think, especially after Baltimore acquired their pieces, do you think Baltimore is kind of the clear front runner for this division? Uh, I think it's probably somewhat in between. I don't think it's a clear front runner. I think they'll maybe win the division by like two games. I don't think it's going to go down the last week, but like I, They'll they'll go into the last game of the season, I think, with the division already clinched. But it'll be it'll be a close one. You're you're taking the Bengals there, Billy? No, I'm taking the Ravens there. You're taking the Ravens? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the Bengals I, I was weird kind, this year. I, I I was kind of confused at that Roquan Smith move. I mean I was too. Mm-hmm. Look, the, the I, I actually lo- love the Ravens. Um their passing offense has kind of settled down after the first few weeks of the season. Lamar actually hasn't passed the ball that well. And, you know, of course, Dobbins still isn't back, and they're, they're working with backup running backs, et cetera. The offense has been putting up points, but obviously, like, they're severely lacking weapons. And right before the trade deadline went down, Mark Andrews got a shoulder injury. Mark Andrews is their best wide receiver. Call it a tight end, whatever you want to call it. He now has a shoulder injury. As a tight end, you know, it, they said it was mild, but he hasn't practiced yet this week. Um, I mean, your best wide receiver went down, wide receiver. You don't really have anyone else that's starting caliber. And then you go out back and get a uh, at the trade deadline and trade for a middle linebacker that's going to have to make $20 million next year when you already have Patrick Queen. Like, you know, are you really chasing a, a championship here? Like, I, I don't really understand that move at all. They, they just they need to pay Lamar next year. They're trading for a guy that's about to be paid $20 million when you already have a starter in place. I just am so confused by that and their lack of willingness to go and get a weapon for, for Lamar. So, yeah, I'm I was, taking, I'm I was confused by that too. I was confused by that too, but like it is an upgrade at linebacker there. But like to give up what they gave up to then also have to – like if you give that up, you're, you're going to pay him. And, or that's a huge failure on your part if you don't pay him after trading that much. But you also have to give out what's going to be the biggest quarterback contract in the league to this offseason. Yeah. I so mean, it's, look, it's if confusing. you're a team and you're paying a middle linebacker over $20 million, like that's a bad move even starting there. Like, unless he's a generational talent. Like, you know, if you're not a pass rusher, which Roquan Smith doesn't rush the pace, he's not a, he's not a um, who's the Cowboys guy? Pen- Micah Parsons. Parsons. He's not a Micah Parsons. Yeah. Like that's just bad resource allocation. You got to pay the whole high profile guy. You got to pay your cornerbacks. You got to pay your pass rusher. You got to pay your quarterback. You got to pay your number one wide receiver. You, you got to pay your left tackle. You don't, you don't pay middle linebackers. I just, eh, I don't like the move. They do have a uh, Deshaun Jackson coming back this week though. So mm-hmm. we'll see if that changes. Anything. It's, it, it, it will be interesting for, you know, Baltimore trying to figure out some of the weapons for um, Lamar Jackson over the second half of the season, I was kind of really high on when they drafted that Isaiah likely from coastal Carolina. I was hoping he would be a nice um, balance between him and Mark Andrews once the season began. And now he is probably going to have to take over on being as Lamar's safety valve for um, their team as they are battling in the AFC North. Now Cleveland and Pittsburgh kind of have hit a wall, even though Cleveland had a huge win last Monday night football again against them. But, um, Kind of briefly just discussing this, you know, in just terms of their um, quarterbacks between uh, Cleveland and Pittsburgh. I know we had kind of discussed this in July when we met before um, the um, preseason had began, but probably this question we'll probably just discuss between the three of us here. Between 
Deshaun Watson, when he comes back during the second half of the season and the way that Kenny Pickett has looked, even though they've really thrown Kenny Pickett into the fire in their first um, few games that he has been there, which situation do you think is probably going to play out better, even though Tomlin's kind of looking forward to probably his first losing season of his career? But which situation do you think is going to play out better between either Kenny Pickett or Deshaun Watson in this second half of the season? Uh, I'll start. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's it got to be Deshaun. Look, I mean, the Browns are picking up first downs, I believe, at the, for every new series. They're the most likely team to pick up a first down after the Bills and the Chiefs. And they're doing that because they run the ball so well. I thought they might move Hunt at the deadline. Turns out that, you know, they didn't have someone that was willing to offer them enough, which, to their credit, he's worth a lot. You know, like everyone's always you – know, Maybe if someone offered them a third round pick, they're like, no, we'd rather have Kareem Hunt. They're still in the playoff hunt. They run the ball so well. Um, Brissett, you know, he's, he's not making crucial mistakes. Uh, and, and then they've he's done his job. He's kept them in position where they're not out of the playoffs when Deshaun's suspension is over. Um, look, it, it's a really talented team, even if they don't have great outside weapons. Uh, Deshaun's a better quarterback. Um, it's got to be the Browns. I mean, yeah, obviously it's got to be the Browns. And you got Deshaun Watson and Kenny Pickett as the two I like the you're comparing here. And obviously Deshaun Watson's a much better quarterback. The Browns are a much better built team. Like that, it's just not even close. The, especially the just the comparing quarterback, which is the most important position. Deshaun Watson. It's been a while since he played, but I'd take a Deshaun Watson. It's been a while since he played over an unproven rookie that has like struggled this year and look at the look at the Steelers too um first of all if we're talking running game Najee Harris looks like Trent Richardson he he mm-hmm. might be strong and he might mm-hmm. you know work out a lot but he doesn't have vision at all he doesn't he's not decisive he's not good running the ball between the tackles he's not good receiving the ball that that's looking like a really really bad pick and a pick that the mm-hmm. Bills were supposed to make and I'm so glad they didn't also, they're in sell mode. They just got rid of Chase Claypool. I mean, they got a good return on him, but I like the trade for the Steelers, but it's not a win-now move. They're looking to the future, and you can't blame them. I mean, they didn't expect to make a quarterback change in week five. Uh, if you're making quarterback changes midseason, that probably means that you're not thinking Super Bowl this year. Uh, it's got to be the Browns. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm in agreement with you guys as well. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm certainly hoping Kenny Pickett can um, turn some things around for that organization, but, you know, obviously, I mean, Cleveland, you know, still kind of somewhat in the playoff hunt. It will be interesting to see Deshaun, you know, finally come back after, you know, really missing out on the last two years in the NFL. But, you know, I'm, I've been impressed with how Kevin Stefanski and company have been able to manage themselves. I think their record doesn't even speak though for what it is. I think their record should have easily been reversed because they lost that one against the Jets early in the season when they blew that, lead after the two minute warning and they had a few other chances to win early on as well but we'll see how that division plays out here and actually what we're going to do actually is we're going to kind of um reverse roles here actually um just kind of covering on the other divisions i'm going to let um one of you kind of ask um the questions and you know just kind of will um debate kind of the two here because i just i don't want to be the only one asking the question so you know whoever wants to um, take on one of the other divisions or ask a question, go ahead and uh, um, let's debate. Are we sticking with the AFC or are we moving? Or um, yeah, we can, stick, the with the AFC. we can okay. stick with the AFC. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. I got one and then, and then uh, uh, Billy, you, you want to go next or you got one ready to go? Uh, you can go and go. All right, Alex and Billy. Mm-hmm. Uh Here's my question for you. A lot of really, really smart people said that um, the AFC West was going to be the best division in football by far. Uh, The Broncos, people have harped on that forever. We can get into that later or another time. Uh, Raiders just got shut out by the Saints last week. But the team that I'm most surprised about, and they actually have a winning record right now, is the Chargers. What the heck's going on with the Chargers, Alex? Why Why is Justin Herbert, who is hailed as – I literally heard my favorite NFL analyst before the season call him the Michael Jordan of football. 
He's re- he's regressed under an offensive minded head coach who values keeping his offense on the field. What's going on with the Chargers? To be honest here, you know, I'm really just kind of really questioning if Brandon Staley is, you know, the right guy for um, the Chargers right now. I mean, you know, I've never really been a fan of how aggressive that he has been, and especially, you know, the one game a few weeks ago against Cleveland when, you know, he went for it on the other side of the field under two minutes. I was like, what in the world are you doing, Staley? And he nearly cost him that game against Cleveland. And certainly Brandon Staley's mindset has also been a – dominant defensive coach their defense has just been non-existent for most of the year I mean it's really just between Herbert and Austin Eckler and really trying to figure out that offense but that defense has just not played up to its potential and I don't know why Staley hasn't been able to crack that especially with all the offseason moves that they did but to be honest I think Justin Herbert probably the other reason that he has regressed this year is I think you know he's also kind of been caught up with injuries. I think he's still kind of dealing with that rib injury that he had at Kansas City early in the season. I think, you know, it's it's one set, one thing to say, you know, playing with pain is one thing, but also you could probably just not play at your best. And I think he's trying to gut through it this year. But, you know, I'm giving him kudos, especially the way he finished that game against Kansas City when he threw that dime into the end zone late in the game, giving them a chance for an onside kick. But Staley and then, defense have not really helped out that Chargers offense this year. And that's where I'm at with Brandon Staley. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably have to agree because you look at like it's it's got to be on, on Staley there because even in especially the defense, they made moves to improve what was one of I don't know exactly where it was, but it ranked near the bottom of the league in defense last year. They made moves to improve that and it just hasn't improved the team as a whole very much. And then, yeah, Herbert dealing with that injury is is a reason too. But Staley, Staley needs to – probably needs to go. It's probably early to say that, but cost them a playoff appearance last year arguably. Yeah, and I mean – They're underwhelming this year. On defense, this team has names and they're mm-hmm. underperforming severely. Bosa, Derwin James – J.C. Jackson, he just got injured mm-hmm. and he's out for the season. That's an, Their backup's going to be an upgrade to what J.C. Jackson is playing like. He does not resemble at all what he looked like in New England. They're paying him huge amounts of money. Then on offense, Keenan's been out, but like Mike Williams is better than any wide receiver that the Ravens have. I mean, like they, they have weapons across the board. And if you have talent and you're not winning, they have a negative point di- differential right now in what was supposed to be maybe the best offense in the NFL this year. Mm-hmm. It's got to be coaching, right? I can only, or that's the easy scapegoat. I, I, I will say this before we kind of move on to the next question as well. One of the things I think as well is I think the Chargers. I know we were talking about this um, earlier in the off season, but I also think with Brandon Staley, you kind of realize that how quickly he jumped through the ranks as well. I think he was like a Division three um, defensive coordinator, maybe Division two. I'm not sure what it was but I mean you know he rose through the ranks I think so quickly to become the head coach of the Chargers I just kind of was a little cumbersome of why they you know basically you know left Anthony Lynn they basically you know let him go and instead they you know are trying to get this defensive mindset head coach and so far defense it's never really been his forte ever since he's been the head coach and as Billy said you know I think you know just in Los Angeles they got to probably try and rethink their strategy maybe after this year or next year. Staley's always been a weird coach to me because he see, he doesn't he seems like the least defensive minded, defensive minded head coach. Right. Like he came from being a defensive coordinator and doesn't seem defensive minded at all. I mean it it's strange because he's so I actually appreciate for a hit because the reason why a lot of head coaches don't make the analytically correct decisions on fourth down is because they don't want to get up in front of the press and have to explain mm-hmm. why they were wrong. So mm-hmm. he has guts, and he goes and he does things that people – the, the, the football uh, world of, of, of coaching, um, the legendary coaches would have never done. But mm-hmm. he has the guts to go and make a fourth down call that the math says is right, but no one really in the, in the standard way of thinking the NFL would. So I actually kind of like his way of thinking there because it's more just that he doesn't mind facing the, the press and saying, you know, like, 
yeah, yeah. I made the, the, the decision I thought was right that the mass said was right and ended up wrong. But on the flip side of that, if he's defensive-minded head coach, you would think that you would want to rely on your defense a little more. So it's kind of ironic. All right. So I guess we'll uh, um, switch to kind of debating with uh, me and Sam. If, Bill, you want to ask a question about the AFC West or the AFC South, Sam and I will. Well, since this. the South is the only way we haven't touched on, I go to that. And, uh, okay. Since, I, I mean, I pretty much know the answer to this. Um, why do the Colts suck, in your opinion? <laughs> like, what is wrong with them? Sam, you want to start with this one? Yeah, I mean, I haven't watched a, a, a ton of the Colts, but I do know that they just cannot run the ball this year. They were obviously last year probably the, the first or second. They were probably the second best rushing team in the NFL in terms of volume and in terms of efficiency. I went to a rainy Monday night football game in Nashville, Tennessee, flew a plane down to watch the Bills put up, you know, 200 yards rushing. Or uh, no, that was Tennessee. Sorry, but I watched in Buffalo two years ago. The, the Colts just demolish the Bills on the ground all game, and it was Jonathan Taylor eating up yards left and right. And um, they don't have that this year. And mm -hmm. you, you know what, Matt Ryan, who I actually thought was really good on the Falcons last year, and because kind of let down by the talent around him, mm -hmm. turning the ball over, making plays that you don't expect from a veteran. And on this Colts team, the way Frank Reich built it. He's asking for somebody that's just not going to turn the ball over. He's looking for a, a lesser Geno Smith this year. Mm -hmm. And Matt Ryan wasn't able to do that. Um, and, you know, when the rush game's not working, then it falls on the quarterback to make some plays. Matt Ryan's not at a place in his career to make those plays. Um, I was always a Frank Reich lover. He was a Bill. Sounds like he's been terrible this year. But, Billy, I'm sure you know way more about whether – Oh, he's, he's been, been terrible. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I would go back to the running game. That was the bread and butter last year. They went, what, they, they had, ten, they were 10 to 6 last year, nine or 10 to 7, something like that. Uh, by oh, just rushing eight. the ball. Yeah, 9 and 8. Okay. Uh, just by rushing the ball, well, you know, they had once last year. So it wasn't the quarterback. Um, can't do it this year. Defense has let them down a few times. And that's, that's where I'm at. Mm -hmm. I'm in agreement with uh, um, Sam as well on this, but I'm actually going to take this uh, – different route here. And this is kind of about um, Ursay's decision when he decided to pull um, Matt Ryan for Sam Ellinger when he started him last week. To me, I don't understand why this kind of has seemed to be the picture when I've kind of seen Indianapolis. I know that they kind of started to right the ship a little bit in Andrew Luck's final year when he was there in 2018. But what I don't understand is like, especially when they went after – Philip Rivers a few years ago, and now you have Matt Ryan. To me, I think the Ursays and their GM, Chris Bauer, I think what they have been really trying to do over the last few years is they're really trying to win with a veteran squad. And what I'm trying to piece together about this is this. I mean, if you're going to, you know, pull the plug for, from Ryan for Sam Ellinger, you have to almost run that offense through Ellinger, Taylor, Pittman, and even your tight ends that you have in Jelani Woods and some of the other guys on your defense. I think their biggest problem is I, is I think they've bought too much into veteran leadership over the last few years. And I think they just kind of need to embrace the youth movement as they kind of did when Andrew Luck was first there in 20, 2012 through 2014. I think if they can just revert back to that, hopefully in the next NFL draft or whatever, I don't know if Ellinger is going to work out. I haven't, you know, really – you know, bought into him as much as, you know, his career was at the University of Texas and how he looked last week at Washington. But I think they just need to embrace the youth movement a little bit to try and right the ship instead of winning with all these veteran players on their roster. Uh, I'll touch on a bit since I know more about the team. But, yeah, so uh, I'll go Frank Reich first. He has been terrible this year. This has actually been the best start to a season the Colts have had with Frank Reich as a head coach, like record-wise. Um, and they have yet to score on the first drive of a game this year. And he has came out and said that, like, all year he's been the one in charge of, like, game planning that first drive there. And they've yet to score on it. And they just fired their offensive coordinator. Uh, they need to fire their O-line coach because that O-line is terrible. Uh, in part because Chris Ballard let three starting caliber players walk. The left tackle and both, like, the both right guards that they had rotating in both walked. So they've that 
those two positions have made Quentin Nelson and Ryan Kelly look much worse than they are, and they haven't played great on top of, of that as it is. Uh, and with that bad O-line play, you have Matt Ryan, who's getting hit every single time when he was in the game. He fumbled like 11 times in his, what, seven games I think he played, and that eventually led to a shoulder injury. They didn't – they benched him anyway. That wasn't – had nothing to do with that. The defense, Shaquille Leonard has played two games all year. So that doesn't help when your best players only play two games. So it, it stems from the O-line, though, because the offense has been terrible. They're not scoring uh, at all. That That's on play calling a lot, too, and, like, personnel decisions. Uh, but, yeah, it's it's the offense is what it is, and it stems to Frank Reich, and it stems to Chris Ballard, who made those decisions. Well – if you're going to be four and three in the AFC division, you might as well be in the AFC South. Yeah, you know? I mean we're that's the Titans reason Frank Reich pulled on to this so job. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, yes. Have they played him yet? Twice. Oh, or no, oh, just really? once. I think. Okay. I think just one. Wait, have it? Has it been twice? It might have been twice. Honestly, I think it has been twice. I cannot remember for some reason. I thought they only played Tennessee once. Let me see. Yeah. Um. No, we lost twenty-four seventeen at home and nineteen ten on the road. So yeah, we have played oh, them twice. Then that's a advantage. lot more tough than I, than I thought. Yeah, no, it's – this. there's a very slim chance that the Colts can win that division because we're eight games in and only have one divisional game left, and it's the last game of the year against the Texans. We have played every other divisional game all the year so far. And of well, course, Titans got the Chiefs this week, so they're going to be going into this week five and three by most accounts. So you well, know. Yeah, well, we're going into the Colts are going into Foxborough, Massachusetts, with a second-year quarterback who's in his second career game. Yeah. So that's Mac Jones. Mac Jones is looking like a rookie these these days. So. He, he had, he's he's regressed a little yeah. bit. I mean, I I have not been impressed by him, but kind of jumping back. I have back hope for Sam Ellinger though. I I think he looked good last week. He showed some promise. I, so so I think yeah. if he can if he can go in to Foxborough and beat the Patriots then I think that there's enough that you can look into to say this, he can be the future. We'll stick him another year out here. So Mm -hmm. kind of sticking with um, this division, I'm going to, I'm just take a turn at a quick question here before we delve into the NFC really quick here. But um, Sam, uh, you texted me a few days ago, um, telling me about um, Trevor Lawrence uh, year. You were saying, um, I guess earlier when we met in the, preseason that you said like he was a bad quarterback but um you want to elaborate a little on the text that um you sent me earlier um this yeah, week you know alex because i made two claims mm-hmm. in on the show that i was uh on over the summer first thing mm-hmm. i said is i love the Colts this year because i watched matt ryan play a lot last year in in atlanta and the bills played them actually and he made some really nice throws and he was just surrounded by a team that Lacked an identity, first-year coach last year. You know, they had Kyle Pitts, who who turned out this year to be not really as good as we thought. But otherwise, you know, lack of weapons, aging offense with, with an aging defense, too. And I was like, bring him into the Colts. I told you I like Frank Reich. Apparently, he's not as good as, I, as, as the people closer to the team think. But I was like, I love this team. I think this team's poised and ready to go. I watched um, – a Colts team with Phillip Rivers almost beat a great Bills team in the first round of the, in the wild card round of the playoffs the year previous. Uh, I like the way he coaches. I'll take the L on that one. It's it, even if the Colts end up nine and eight again, I know this team is not as good as w- what I thought that they were. So I'll take that one. But I also said, everyone says Lawrence needs a new coach and he'll be fine. And I said, I watched a lot of his games last year and maybe he's just not that good. And a part of that was kind of, you know, I, I'm a data analyst by trade. So, you know, I, I, I really do respect the numbers and the analytics. But I really made that call just based on the way that he plays. And it, he's really like, he doesn't seem like he, you, you know, it's Josh Allen play. He is, I can tell when he gets mad. I can tell that his players support him and get behind him. And, you know, Lawrence put up incredible numbers in college. I know he's got the arm. He can move a little bit too. He had decent decision, great decision making in college, but he just like I, I don't feel like he's a he's a guy that the team can rally around. And I figured that out when the team was falling apart around him when they had, um, Florida head coach, Urban uh, Meyer, Urban Meyer coaching last year. And like, if there was a leader in that locker room, like like a quarterback, 
that team would not have imploded in that way. And everyone was thinking, great prospect. Came out as probably the best prospect maybe since Luck, maybe since Manning, people were saying. And, mm. and you know, he – he just didn't look great last year, and he, he looked just – I didn't watch the game on ESPN Plus this weekend because I couldn't watch it. They don't have ESPN Plus. But what did he throw for? 150 yards, 50% completion percentage. Lost you know, lost to Denver, who's been one of the most abysmal teams in the league. I'll take the L on the Colts, but you know what? I, I, I'll, I'll reach some glory for, for saying that maybe Trevor Lawrence just isn't good. Yeah, I just want to uh, highlight I saw this the other day after week three when they were two and one. He said, uh, there's no denying that we're a good football team, and they have not won since. Nope. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, last item of business probably here in the AFC, though, before we um, move quickly into the NFC. Um, kind of just looking right now at the updated playoff picture, just kind of trying to determine the seeds here. I know big game against Tennessee and Kansas City um, this week. That could easily decide the number – two seed there, but I think Buffalo's one and Kansas City is two. Really Tennessee is kind of tied with them at five and five and two. But I think Tennessee I think Tennessee has a better divisional record than Kansas City. So I think Buffalo is one, Tennessee two, Kansas City three, Baltimore is four. The number five seed would be um I guess Miami or the Jets. And that would be five and six and then um, and then the Chargers would be seven. So, you know, so about those seven teams there, I'd probably just say my quick thing to you is just kind of seeing that about the Bills. I mean, do you kind of see if the playoffs run through Buffalo this year? Could Buffalo um, host the AFC championship? I mean, yeah, I hope so. Um, with the head to head, you really got to think it is Buffalo. But look, here's the secret about Buffalo. Everyone, Buffalo's building a new stadium, and all the hardcore Buffalo fans are like, we don't want a dome, we're hardy, we like the snow, we like the cold. Look, the Bills are an air offense. They air the ball out, they throw the ball much better than they run the ball. We're much better in a dome than we are outside in Buffalo in the winter. So to be honest with you, home field advantage doesn't – might – be you know i if we play a team that runs the ball really well in the playoffs and it happens to be a snowy day in december i'd rather be in a dome so you know i i i don't love that um but look we're probably going to lock up the one seed because we got the one the head to head against the chiefs mm-hmm. and you know I, do, I hate to complain when i root for an incredible football team but the rest of the regular season becomes don't let your best players get hurt um so you know i would take a loss Meaning that if, if I could, if uh, everyone stayed healthy and we lost one game, I'd rather everyone stay healthy because I, I'm really confident that we'll get there. And it's all about being healthy and peaking at the playoffs. I think it runs through Buffalo. I don't really think that helps the Bills that much. Um, but the rest of the regular season for the Bills right now is keeping their best players healthy. Mm-hmm. And probably just, you know, my thing to you, Billy, about this is um, do you just, do you kind of see any of those um teams that probably either won the division or any potential teams that you can think steal on the Bills thunder in the postseason or do you kind of see Buffalo as a clear runaway favorite I mean it's it's them and the Chiefs but like obviously the Bills are gonna if it and like they're gonna end up hosting it because they've already beat the Chiefs they have that tiebreaker over them and I think it's gonna be the Chiefs aren't gonna pass them in record and I, I think the the Bills are the better team this year so I think they're the best team in the AFC Love it. All right, well, let's go ahead and quickly um, – And they just switch. they just added Naheem Hines to the team too, so it just got even better. Right. Yeah. Need that. And we got rid of Zach Moss, which is you – know, Yeah, that was a terrible trade for the Colts. Yeah, I don't know yeah. what they were. That, that, that was a weird trade. When I Zach Moss in a sixth for Naheem Hines. Makes me yeah. think Naheem Hines requested to be traded because you could get much more than that. Yeah, and Zach Moss is really bad. <laughs> He's yeah, like yeah he took Naheem Hines' or... number. Yeah. All right, well, let's go ahead and quickly uh, switch gears here to uh, the NFC. Just briefly, I just kind of wanted to say, Sam, it's about 8.20 right now. So if you um, either just wanted to stick around and talk about the NFC briefly, or if you want to go, you're free. Yeah, I, I got to hop, guys. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, but I'll be back whenever you need me. Um, let me know. Love love uh, talking to NFL. You just wanted to guys. talk about the Bills. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really <laughs> – 
I should just come in for the bills section. Yeah. What, 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 I, I was going to say, what I'll do is I'm hoping to reach out to you guys around Thanksgiving, maybe the week before or maybe Tuesday. We'll, we'll hopefully see if we can get together around there. Talk a little World Cup. Yeah, uh, we get the week before World Cup starts on that uh, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, so we can talk about yeah. that. Let's go. Mm-hmm. All right, thanks, Alex. Thanks, Billy. All right, yeah. Have a good night, Sam. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's keep looking up the World that. Series. That's what I'm I'm doing up there. Oh. So, how, what's how, how's Game Five going on? Uh, it's one one right now. Uh, Schwarber hit a leadoff home run for the Phillies a minute ago. Yeah, we're gonna we're, we're gonna briefly just discuss that um, soon here, but. Um, let's quickly just um, talk about the uh, NFC um, really quick here. Briefly, just probably just talk about the NFC East. Probably the three biggest storylines in this division so far. Philadelphia is still riding high at 7-0. and Right now they got Houston tonight. My Giants coming off a bitter loss against uh, Seattle last week. And, of course, Dallas at 6-2. and Hopefully will be an interesting Thanksgiving day game between Dallas and the Giants, depending on what happens to them over the next few weeks but really briefly though I know Washington their record of, at, at four and four winning their last three games has kind of put them into position but just the recent news out of today with Dan Snyder possibly inkling um, letting go of the um, Washington Commanders franchise probably my question to you about this Billy is this do you think um, Snyder is going to be forced to push out of the team or do you think that um, that email or whatever was sent out was just kind of silly or just kind of saying, you know, I just want attention for um, getting rid of this team? I mean, he's going to eventually be forced out. Like there's been – I mean, it's really just one owner that's spoken out against him so far when Ursa did it a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. But, like, it's it's eventually going to get to the point where they ha- where he's going to be forced out, like, and he's going to have to sell the team. They're going to make him do it. Mm-hmm. And it's it's long overdue at this point. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm certainly have been Ron Rivera's biggest supporter ever since he went to Washington all those years ago from the Panthers, and I'm I'm kind of hoping you know if if he's able to step out. I mean I don't know how the final um, nine games are going to go for him this year, but you know if if he can at least get a winning season, or if they just decide to sell the team, you know I think Rivera's probably best chances for him to probably just get out of town and hopefully just them hiring somebody else because he's really taking this season hard, especially after just hearing that his mother passed away earlier last week. He has taken um, a hard toll ever since he's become Washington's head coach. And then probably just seeing the other three teams, as I mentioned, you know, Philadelphia trying to go 8-0 and for the first time in franchise history tonight against the Texans and Dallas and the Giants at 6-2. and Part of my question to you about Billy is this, and I'll then give you I'll give my take on this. Which of those three teams has been the biggest surprise so far through the first half of the season? Uh, I mean, the Eagles. Have, uh, no one expected them to be undefeated. That's got to be the biggest surprise. And with how their schedule looks, they could probably go seventeen and zero. Yeah, because mm-hmm. it is not a tough schedule at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Taking care of their business so far against some of the um, better teams. Early on, you know, I would say I am pleased with uh, my Giants at six and two right now. Dallas, I'm kind of still out on Dak Prescott a little bit. I know they kind of edged him in over the first few games that he's been back. Of course, they beat Detroit and they beat um, who they beat last week because I don't think they, I don't think it was Detroit who they beat last week. Yeah, because it was Miami last week that uh, beat Detroit. Chicago, Chicago is who Chicago. They, that's who it was. So, so it's the Lions in Chicago, but. Yeah. But like I said, though, that Thanksgiving Day game, I mean, the Giants' next two games after their bye, I think they have Detroit and they have Houston. So if both teams are 8-2 and two when they meet each other um, come Thanksgiving, that will be a huge game um, that weekend to watch for, for them here. And um, kind of as I did here, just, you know, we'll probably just briefly go over these next three divisions, but I'll switch this off to you, Billy, if you want to ask me a question on either one of the other three divisions. Um, with uh, the NFC South, we'll, we'll, they're the worst division in, in the league. Uh, who do you think wins that? Like who just like is the war, the best of the worst? Do you think the Falcons hold on to that? Or do you think Tom Brady and the Bucs can bounce back? 
I don't think the other two are even in the conversation. I think it's just the, those two. I, I will say this. I mean, you know, right when I said it the earlier this season, I've always liked the position that Atlanta has been in for most of the season. I know Carolina should have beat them last week and that thriller of a game between them because DJ Moore, you know, overreacted at the end of the game, cost Eddie Pinheiro a chance to win at the end. But then Pinheiro missed a short one in overtime. And then, you know, Atlanta just – goes down the field and basically young who coo gives them the four and four advantage in this division. I, I like Atlanta as the front runners. I think Timba Bay, um, I, I, I've been wanting to say this for so many years about Jason Licht and this organization. And, you know, I think it's shared for really all of the other three teams. It's like, they basically have not really bought in so much into the future for their organizations. Cause if, Tom Brady decides that this is his last year, and I'm really thinking that is going to be with the way he's acted on the field and the way that, you know, he's – this team has just fallen apart. I think it's, you know, time for him to go. New Orleans is in a situation right now. I know they just beat the Raiders 24 to nothing, but I'm still not bought in on their quarterback in Carolina. Who knows? I mean, I like P.J. Walker. I mean, he could put some zip on the ball, and he's got a nice – um couple of games under his belt, but he's certainly not a franchise quarterback on that team. But I just think the way Atlanta has been run right now, knowing that Marcus Mariota has been, I think, as good as he feels that he can be, knowing that Desmond Ritter is behind him waiting to take the reins from him, I think Atlanta's in the best position of any of the four teams in the NFC South right now. Yeah, I mean, it's – and to think how, like – how bad people expect that team to be and how like the, they don't have good quarterback play. So if with, if Ritter can in the future develop how they want him to, or they even, they take a quarterback in the draft next year, like they're going to be good in the future. And not to mention, we're just completely, I mean, we talked about one trade that happened uh, when we mentioned uh, Hines earlier, they traded Ridley to the Jags, the Falcons did. Mm-hmm. Suspended for one year, and then Jacksonville will see how they either reap reap the rewards or not. But I mean, you know, we talked about Christian Kirk and those guys, and um, we'll see probably what happens with him and Ridley next year. And then probably just briefly covering the last two divisions. Certainly, Minnesota has been really the brightest storyline so far in the NFC North right now. They're six and one, huge advantage over Green Bay and Chicago right now, but. My thing to you is this. I know I was just mentioning this about Tom Brady. When are we going to start finally blaming Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady for kind of being too full themselves right now? I understand people are making a big deal. I think it's finally happening. I know, but I'm just saying, I think think Green Bay's front office and Tampa Bay's front office, I know that there's been blame on them over the last few weeks, but you're talking about a four-time league MVP in Aaron Rodgers, and yet he still feels like, you know, he's probably going to be either the decision maker or he's, you know, going to be in charge of this team because he still has three years left on that contract they gave him this offseason. How, how do you see that whole thing playing out, especially what Green Bay's going through and especially what Minnesota did this offseason, giving Kirk Cousins a one-year extension? Now he's reaping the rewards with Kevin O'Connell with while Aaron Rodgers is not dealing – with much with Matt LaFleur now as his head coach. I mean, I think that obviously they have Rodgers for that long and they're whatever he says, they're pretty much going to have to do. Uh, So they're going to, he's going to make them do some move or he's going to threaten retirement. Like he's done like, or not threaten. He's going to consider retirement. Like he has done for the past two or three years. And I think that team is going to be a disaster after he retires. Mm -hmm. I agree. Certainly not thinking Jordan Love is their future. You know, you know, he looked shaky in that game against Kansas City. Yeah, and the farther we get away from that pick, the the worse and worse it looks. Just because Rodgers is just going to keep playing out of spite is what it seems like that they picked him. And I think Matt Lafleur, his, his style of running that Green Bay offense has not really been what I thought it would be. I wanted him really to center it around AJ Dillon, and Aaron Jones, and that hasn't really worked out for much of this season. And then briefly, lastly, let's just talk really quick about the NFC West, which has been a really toss-up division right now. We were just talking about Geno 
Smith before, he has to be perhaps one of the greatest stories I've seen so far this season, probably between him and Saquon Barkley and a select others. But, you know, what do you think – how do you think this division will probably play out between uh, Seattle and San Francisco? Because certainly the Rams have not been impressive to me throughout this season. And, of course, Arizona is just treading water, it seems, right now with Kyler Murray trying to see what he does week in and week out. Do you think this is going to be a two-team race or possibly a three-team race for – on the division title for the NFC West? I think all four of them could compete for it. I don't think they're all going to do it. I don't think the Cardinals are even uh, – the Cardinals theoretically could. I don't think they are. But the other three could compete for it. The Rams have to turn it around. But if the if Geno Smith and the Seahawks keep playing like they are, they're going to win that division. And I would love to see that because Geno Smith is finally getting his shot. He hasn't gotten a real shot since his second season when he was with the Jets, and they sort of wrote him off after that. And mm-hmm. it seems like everyone in the league except for the Seahawks now have had written him off before this year. But I would love for the for him to go out in his first season starting since, what, 2014 About so. uh, and win a division. I've certainly been impressed with that um, team so far. Of course, you know, I mean, keeping um, – Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf have been huge, and I saw that game last week. I know it was a bitter loss for my Giants. Richie James has got to learn to hold on to those punts better last week. But what I love so much about this Seattle Seahawks team is kind of as I mentioned with your Indianapolis Colts. I know Geno Smith is you know a veteran and everything, but Kenneth Walker has been a nice. Yep, I was about to mention him, but I I forgot to mention him the first time. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he's had a nice start to his rookie season so far. That what wouldn't I don't know where how he's come out, but people are talking like he's going to be defensive rookie of the year. Oh yeah, Tariq Woolen, yeah, he's been Tariq Woolen, amazing yeah. for them. He, he's he's come out of the woodwork really really strong this year as a rookie, and of course you know and uh, Kobe Bryant has been solid over there at their their other yeah. rookie corner. Mm-hmm. I mean, just they're, they're really trying to embrace that youth movement as they kind of first did when Russell Wilson kind of went there to that organization in 2013 but certainly will be interesting to see how the nfc west plays out but what we're going to go ahead and do is i think that's going to do it for our coverage of uh um the nfl right now we're going to briefly um talk about um probably some of the um early storylines of what has been uh probably whatever you could call it chaotic or whatever you might call it as for um, the NBA season starting a few weeks ago. I, I don't know if you had caught this or not, but I had a special guest on last week who was a Charlotte Hornets fan like yourself. And I had was just talking to him about the um, Knicks and Hornets game that they played last week. But um, what I'm actually going to have you do is I'm going to um, just have you briefly talk about um, the Hornets or some of your biggest storylines, but I'm actually going to prepare myself for a take. I'm going to, channel my inner Stephen A. Smith on this one to lay on lay in, lay into my Knicks a little bit. But, you know, if you want to talk about your Hornets or any storylines that you want to talk about, go ahead. I need to prepare. Uh, I can actually mention something I literally saw pop up on my phone earlier. Let me find it. Mm-hmm. Where'd it go? Um, oh, I forgot the notification. The Nets just suspended Kyrie Irving without pay. They traded him? No, they suspended him without pay. Oh, they so he did not be playing. Yeah. Good, 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 good. And then uh, I don't know if you saw or not, but apparently they are looking at Ime Udoka as their yep. new head coach, which doesn't seem right, especially no. after he got so, – did he get officially get fired from the Celtics? I remember they were saying that we're going to suspend him for the year. I guess they just officially fired him. If what, it's what a possibility I, he joins a new team. What I heard originally is I thought that someone in the management leaked it from the Boston Celtics. They leaked um, that um, whatever it was, domestic violence or whatever they want to call it against the um, female in the workplace. But, you know, I think they leaked that information out and a lot of people were um, suspicious about it at first. They didn't kind of want to believe if it was true or not, but I think people just said they made the right move in getting rid of him, but who knows? I don't know really who to believe in that regard, but I, I, I don't like the way that 
Joe Sy and Sean Marks have really handled that situation. I mean, and I'll even throw this on Kyrie Irving, just briefly, just bringing that up. How do you disgrace the Jewish, Christian, and other communities like that when you're just posting this stuff on Twitter or whatever, and you say, like, you can't judge me by, like, what I put on there when, you know, he was talking to the ESPN reporters or whatever, kind of being confident with them you're a superior athlete and people can give you passes for that but you can't give you pass for putting that offensive content on twitter that just can you know ruin other people's lives or be scared about it. i mean you know who knows he was how- given the opportunity to like back like back down from saying that and apologize mm-hmm. for it and he refused to mm-hmm. and of course he was forced to pay half a million dollars to the anti-defamation league as well both him and Josiah and Sean Marks, both of them were ordered to pay half a million dollars. What? Why are you, why are I, want, I want to hear your Stephen A. take now. All right. Okay. We'll, we'll switch. We'll switch up the gears a little bit. We kind of we're going down a, a different path right. there. I want to hear hear right. something more, a little more lighthearted here. Let's get a good take in. The New York Knicks are a national disgrace. You're three and one. Three losses in a row. Three. Three losses in a row, and you scored 10 points against Atlanta last night. 10. 10 points against Atlanta last night. And, of course, you're just chucking up threes. The whole third quarter, you're just chucking up threes. You just think you can get back in the game after you're up 23 points. If you want to play like Pat Riley or when Jeff Van Gunny were your head coaches, embody what that team was like back then. You had Ewan. You had Oakland. You had John Starks, you had Allen Houston, you had Spreewell and all those guys. If you want to play like that, you have to play defensive style. It worked the first year you were there, Thibodeau, and now you're just chucking out threes like you don't care. It's like, you know, you were the one of the worst teams in just field goal attempts. You shot field goal attempts at a high mark in your first year when you took over that organization. I know they were dead last in field goals made in field goal attempt it. What makes you think that you can just flip the switch and just say, you know what, we're just going to check up threes and we're just going to see if it hits in the basket or not. That's not how you play. I mean, the D de- I mean, you think that you can be a consistent defensive team in the NBA. You're just wrong. You can't win just by defense alone. You have to just play offense to a point and seeing the guys that are really going off right now, like Donovan Mitchell and Cleveland and, Giannis in Milwaukee and seeing some of the other dominant ones. I'll even throw in Damian Lillard and and, and for May Simmons in Portland right now, what that combination has done. What has Thibodeau done to this team? I mean, just he wants to play like Pat Riley or Jeff Van Gundy. You have to just body up and just be physical, but I just don't see that way as there term of success right now. I mean, you scored 10 points, 10 points against Atlanta last night, and you lose three straight. Unacceptable. Just unacceptable. Yeah, and uh, sort of stick in on the topic of the Knicks. Dennis Smith Jr. has looked good since he left. Yes, he has. Mm-hmm. He's looked pretty good this year in Charlotte. Thanks for rubbing it in. <laughs> <laughs> How do I do on that take, Stephen A. Smith? That, that was I, – I thought that was – I was talking to Stephen A. for a second there. So. <laughs> oh, well, but um, but as I mentioned, though, I mean, you know, just talking about um, Kyrie Irving and just that horrible situation in Brooklyn, hopefully, you know, Joe Sy and Sean Marks can handle that right now. But probably my one question I have on the NBA here, just kind of seeing some of the more – surprising teams i know we're not we're barely not a tenth of the way into the season right now but milwaukee the only undefeated team right now cleveland certainly has looked sharp with donovan mitchell and um those guys and also you had um you have phoenix portland and utah really just kind of battling out for the top three teams which team do you think has been the more surprising you know taking the lead you know either in their divisions or really in the conference standings right now which team has surprised you the most um i really don't know because like all these teams were like somewhat expected i mean i guess it's it's kind of surprising that i mean it's still early in the year with this Mm -hmm. stuff but like the thunder are 
four and three. Dallas has the same record as Oklahoma City, which yeah. I would not have expected. And then Minnesota's kind of off to a slow start too. They are, yeah, yeah. After Gobert, trading for Rudy Gobert, yeah, Gobert and those guys haven't really paid dividends just yet. And of course, one of the bigger storylines as well is how dismal the Lakers' start was. I mean, starting zero and four and um, really they're the wrong and they're uh, two and five yeah. right now. That's yeah. I mean, they've won two of their last three. That offense has looked terrible. I, I mean, I, I mean, I. I've, I've never really been a Lakers fan, you know, I mean, of course I've been a diehard Knicks fan for most of my life, but you know, I have never really seen the Lakers as bad as they were just then. And what I was trying to hope for, what I was trying to look for is like when the previous last time they had started a year 0 and four, I mean, I don't think they probably ever did that under when Kobe and Shaq were there, but you know, I mean, I just, I, I can't even remember the last time they, started off that bad to begin a year. Yeah, that's it, – it's that's a weird team. Mm-hmm. Very, very weird, like, roster construction, too. Like, I don't, I don't know why a team would – like, it was questionable at the time somewhat. It was hoped for. But, like, why would you go out and get Russell Westbrook at this point in his career with that much money he's being paid? I was going to say, I just, I just saw here, I think they finished 17 and 65 in the 2015 and 16 season. And that year they started um, 0 and 4. And in their first 10 games. They probably had a couple 0 and 4 years uh, in like the the mid to the 2010s, like, or, like after, right. like late after Kobe all. years, like after Kobe yeah. retired. Uh huh. Yeah, you're probably right. Mm hmm. But yeah, just kind of, kind of an odd start for um, some of those um, teams right here, and also probably just briefly kind of maybe talking about um, with um, college basketball um, starting um, next week. Are you a big uh, college basketball watcher, or just kind of excited for the season uh, to be here next week? I'm not huge on college basketball. Mm-hmm. Probably would get into it more if Georgia wasn't like the laughing stock of the SEC right, right. in college mm-hmm. basketball. Right. Um, but I mean, it's. I mean, obviously, it's far out until this. But March Madness is some of the most fun you have watching watching sure. right. yeah. sports. I, I, but that's that's pretty far out. But it's still the same sport. So it's finally getting to start up here. Yeah, I'm 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 kind of excited to see it. You know, kind of I'm 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 really kind of hoping as well. I know um, UNC Charlotte just had a huge win against Rice last week. Thank goodness that they finally turned that around. Of course, Axing Will Healy is one thing, but, you know, just trying to get some moments back. I, I kind of like the way that their team is now. I, you know, I know you were mentioning this a couple of broadcasts ago that you had the chance to interview Ali Khalifa, you said. Did you were, you talk to him for a project or I, something? You I don't think that was me that said that. Um, oh, okay. I thought there was something we talked about. I'm not sure. Maybe Maybe that was just me when I was just doing the – research about him. I thought you had mentioned to me that you interviewed someone for um, a project for um, class that you had either a semester ago or something, but I could be wrong. Yeah, what is, uh, what's Charlotte's record right now sitting at for, I don't even know, I I sort of stopped following. Yeah, two and seven right now. Two and seven, yeah, that's not not good. Not much home to write about here, but um probably just maybe briefly talking about this um, quick right now, you know, probably just jumping, you know, into college right now. What a huge weekend this week for um, some of the big teams. Of course, oh, Georgia probably against- one of the most important games being played, most important regular season game of the college football playoff era being played this weekend. Absolutely. I mean, number one, Georgia against number – It's three. actually number one, Tennessee. Well, in, in the college football ranking, yeah. Yeah, well, that's the only one that matters now. Mm-hmm. Right, and of course, I mean, Georgia, I mean, I, I, I think Georgia – I think Georgia you know, wins. They cover the spread. They're, yeah, they're going to win that game. It's in Athens. Tennessee is a – like their defense is like below average. They don't control the clock at all. Like – or in, in below average in terms of like yards allowed per game. But like that – they're not going to have the 
crowd on their side like they did when they played Alabama. Georgia's not going to commit as many penalties as Alabama did. Georgia might have less penalties committed on the year than Alabama had in that one game against Tennessee. And that's how they, that's how Tennessee won that game. It's not going to go that way for Tennessee. Georgia's going to win, and they'll probably win by two scores. I remember talking to somebody um, before the season began, and I just really felt – it right from the start, especially after last year. I, I know Alabama went undefeated. Last, well, strike that. No, they didn't go undefeated because they lost to Texas A&M. But I thought last year I saw um, something, you know, in Nick Saban that felt like they've you know, gotten a, a lot team. more undisciplined in the past yeah. two years. We're like last year, they were pretty more. undisciplined, and it's it's even more this year. Like they that game against Tennessee, they broke their school record for penalties in a game. Mm-hmm. It's going to be interesting to see how that game plays out. I'm, I'm really kind of hoping to see if uh, Stetson Bennett and Hooker really go at it for a high-scoring game. That's going to really improve. That's their, going to be interesting because yeah, because it's it's hilarious looking at that because Hendon Hooker's 24 and Stetson Bennett's 25, and there's several quarterbacks in the NFL that are younger than both of them. I know, right? I mean, they're I mean they're certainly going to be prized prospects, you know, one way or another when um that game goes on. Another big game as well, number six, Alabama against number 15, LSU. That could be a huge um, game actually, as well. I think, uh, I think for the college playoff rankings, I think LSU is actually number 10. Wow, okay. so yeah, Which is very game. shocking. I know, especially from where they came last year, trying to rewrite the script with Brian Kelly and those guys. Um, still kind of looking as well. Um, probably just kind of giving some love as well to some of the underachieving things. I'm, I was kind of hoping as well, probably like once we meet around Thanksgiving and probably just kind of see about the bowl games and everything. I mean, we're not going to dissect all of them, but, you know, we'll probably just kind of, you know, pick some of our favorites here. But I got to throw some um, underachieving teams or probably just some lower teams. Give them some love here. How about um, a matchup on Friday? I'm going to try and catch this tomorrow between UMass and Connecticut. I got to give credit to Jim Mora going to Connecticut after – Connecticut had not won a game at all last year. They are four and five, and they can win their fifth game of the year against Massachusetts and just maybe just win one more game to be bowl bound if they um, can win against UMass tomorrow. That's a huge shock to me to see how UConn has kind of really stepped up this year. Um, also, kind yes, of they were arguably the worst team like worst D1 team in the nation last year. Yeah. I also see right here kind of seeing how the Big Ten is going to play out as well. 14th ranked Illinois against Michigan State and number four Michigan against Rutgers. I've been really impressed seeing how Illinois has played for much of this year. Chase Brown has looked really good, but that's been an all-around solid team. And I think whoever comes out in that – one division because Michigan and Ohio State are undefeated right now. If they, if whoever plays Illinois, I think Illinois can give them a decent chance. I mean, I don't think Illinois could beat them outright, but I think Illinois could easily sneak up on them with um, how good they've looked so far this season. Another good game that could be interesting: Clemson at Notre Dame. Yeah, this weekend. Uh-huh. Yeah, Notre Dame's kind of started to right the ship a little bit, winning five of their. Last six, if I believe, they started zero and two, and then they just beat. Yeah, those were rough. Those were rough two games for them. They, they those were, yeah. I mean, especially against Marshall too, when they, losing to them after losing to Ohio State. Yeah. Um, we also got Wake Forest at NC State, twenty-one versus twenty-two. That was an odd week last week. Wake Forest losing to Louisville and North Carolina State barely surviving their matchup against Virginia Tech, I think, right? Yeah, I think that was – Yeah, that was a – was that a Thursday game or a Friday game? I, think I don't think they played there on Saturday. It was but, Thursday, yeah. yeah. I, I think it was a Thursday game. But I, I, I believe was, they um, – NC State had brought in a new quarterback in that game. Yeah, yeah, I think they yeah, MJ Morris. Yep, MJ Morris right. came in. My, yeah. my friend yeah, was at that game. He was telling me about that. O'Leary is out. Yeah, he's yeah. He's well, out. no, because uh, they had another one that started that game. Um, because O'Leary was out, and apparently he just wasn't doing it oh. for him in the first half. And they brought in MJ Morris, who I vaguely remember the name because I remember hearing like in recruiting, like not even for his senior year. I remember people mentioning his name his junior year as someone that Georgia could go after because he's from the state. But ultimately, Georgia ended up 
getting a different quarterback and he went to NC State, but it's it's cool to see him performing at a like pretty solid. He came in and won a game for NC State as a true freshman. Mm-hmm. I, I'll even say this, kind of going on the ACC right now. I know we were just talking about Clemson. I mean, North Carolina has looked really good right now. I think Drake May has looked impressive to my eyes this year, but probably my question to you is this. If it comes down between them and Clemson for um, the ACC championship game, do you still think Clemson's going to be the outright favorite in that, or do you think Drake May can go toe-to-toe with uh, DJ? DJ I think Drake May can do that. I think UNC is really good. Drake May is – I think Drake May is the best quarterback in the ACC. I agree. Uh, agree. And he might end up being the best quarterback in the nation next year. Mm -hmm. It's going to, I mean, next year it's got to be between him and Caleb Williams. They're going to be the only, like, it's the clear top two. I think, I think I saw, I think Drake May's like sixth in Heisman odds right now, which he, yeah, Drake May is good. Good for him. We've got a number six right now in the Heisman race and probably um, trying to see the other teams as well. I will say this what I'm really, what I'm really shocked about this year is kind of talking about the, Big 12 really briefly. I would love to see a Big 12 championship game without Oklahoma State or Oklahoma. I mean, TCU has been a great story this year with Max Duggan and those guys, but if they face off against Kansas State, that will be a fun game to see those two teams, especially Adrian Martinez being out the last two weeks. That Howard that has replaced him, I mean, him and um, whoever that running, Deuce Vaughn. Yeah, Howard Bryant yeah. or Bryant Howard and Deuce Vaughn for that offense on Kansas State that has been electric. Kansas um, State plays Texas this week. Yeah, I think I think that Kansas could be State an interesting one. I think they could beat them in that in that game. Um and I'll see who TCU plays. TCU has gotten they play Texas Tech. They got unlucky in the uh yeah. in the college World playoff game. poll. They should oh, they oh. should be higher than seven, honestly. I, like I agree. Yeah. I get it was a close game against West Virginia, but like that's an undefeated team. I still remember has beaten Oklahoma, Kansas, Oklahoma State, and Kansas State. I still remember that one year. I think it was like seven or eight years ago. TCU was like in the top five. I think. I think they were up as high as like number three, like in twenty fourteen or yeah. I think it was. They 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 barely missed the playoff. Who was their quarterback that year? Oh man. Yeah, let me check. Oh, who was that? Was that, was that when that, Trayvon Boykin was, was there? That was when uh, um, Gary Patterson was their head coach, too, right in the midst of his great I want to say that Trayvon Boykin was their quarterback. You, 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 are, you are right, yeah. Passed for 33 touchdowns and 10 interceptions that year. Completed 61.2% of his passes, yeah. Their only blemish. That year yeah, I believe were, Trayvon Boykin well, is in prison right. right now, or he got charged with something. Really? Hmm. Nice. Yeah, it happened a couple years ago, I think. I don't know exactly. Their, their, their only blemish that season was against Baylor. They lost a high-scoring game, 61-58 to was their only blemish in that year, but they played in the Peach Bowl against Ole Miss, and they beat them 42-3, to so – just yeah, Trayvon fine. Boykin was sentenced to three years in prison in 2020. So, hmm. yeah, hopefully, he just kind of ends up, you know, getting his life back on track, especially after um, trying to check the some of the other interesting Who else games. Was on those teams, I'm trying to was a. Uh... Was Josh Doxson on any of those teams? Who? What, what, what's what's Josh Doxson? Josh Doxson. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking about him. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, think I, I could not there. remember if he was there during that time. Yeah, he. Yeah, he. He played three years with with him. He he broke out in 2015. The the year after, I guess they um finished um outside of the. Playoff, yeah, 78 receptions, 1,300 plus yards, 14 receiving touchdowns in 2015. Just trying to see as well some of the other 
big games this week. Oh, Jeff Gladney was on that team too. That's another NFL player. Yeah. Ben Banigou, that's another NFL player on that team. Mm-hmm. LJ Collier, that forgot he existed. I cannot believe yeah. the Seahawks took him in the first round. Mm-hmm. I think we covered all the big games for this week. Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, I was just kind of just trying to see. Like, yeah, I, 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 knew, I knew later tonight Appalachian State played Coastal Carolina. I was going to probably. Oh, that's a that's an interesting game right there. Yeah, yeah, kind of seeing how how. Appalachian State. I mean, they blew out Robert Morris last last week. Obviously, an FCS opponent. I think I I was looking at this the other week. I think they um, had Appalachian State against winless Robert Morris, like at fifty one and a half point favorites going into that game. Of course, you know, obviously, like I said, an FCS opponent. Another big game. I think I'm going to watch tomorrow night. This is going to be late. I don't know how. Late, you're probably gonna stay up, but I want to catch. Oh, I can't here. stay up late. Me and my friends are going to Cincinnati this weekend, and we're leaving at like four o'clock on Saturday. So I'm not gonna stay up late tomorrow. Oh, okay, <laughs> but I was just saying, uh, I think 24th Frank Oregon State plays Washington. I'm hoping to see if Michael. Yeah, Pennix that could be interesting. Well in that game, yeah, that yeah, that should be a good one. There, um, seeing who else, but I, like you said, I think we did cover most of them. Seeing Cincinnati lose last week was a Bit of a surprise. UCF will play Memphis. I have a cousin of mine who went to UCF, and he's kind of been following their football team. He was a huge Blake Bortles fan when he was there at UCF, and you know he's probably going to be watching that game against Memphis over the weekend. Um, yeah, I think we kind of covered most. Well, I was going to say, um, probably outside of this, um, you know, if you wanted to um, probably just talk briefly about um, anything else, I had mentioned, you know, we were probably just going to talk briefly about the um, Major League postseason, but I want, I just want to be brief. I know we, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's in the middle of the World Series. It probably would be better to wait until the end of that because it's, I mean, it's. Yeah. It's a tie game and a tie series right now. So <laughs> yeah, I just I, I I just I I just each game has been definitely. very different too. It has been. Yeah, I, I just it, I it just, was an amazing game. Game one, Phillies or Astros blowout. Game two, Phillies blowout. Game three, and then a no hit last night. Third third no hitter in world in postseason history. Don Larson, Roy Holiday, and um, then just last night with the combined. Um, no hitter. Um, probably just wanted to um, just touch though on just a few things. I know this was just earlier in this postseason, but I, I just hated the fact that that whole um, Mets series against San Diego, whatever was that foreign substance on Joe Musgrove, I don't know why they kind of let him still pitch in that game. That was so weird. And then really just seeing the Braves being let down in that um, – division series. Oh, it was only like three players that played good. I felt so bad knowing that you went to those first two games in Atlanta and they just let you down. They just didn't. Game two was was good because Kyle Wright was the only pitcher that wanted to do anything. Right. Uh, But game one, I mean, the only offensive players that wanted to win that game, that series, it seemed like was Travis Darno, Matt Olson, Ronald Acuna. That was it. Yeah. And then Kyle Wright was the only pitcher that showed up. Yeah, Matt the Olsen, only starter that showed up. The bullpen was okay. Matt Olson just disappeared for you guys, I think, in that series too. No, Matt Olson was amazing that series. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, it was yeah. everyone else. Dansby Swanson and Austin Riley disappeared that series. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, Matt Olson hit a home run that brought us within one run in Game One. He he was one of the I think Darno. Uh, Austin Riley, or not sorry, not Austin Riley, Darno, Matt Olson, and Ronald Acuna were the only players on the team, I think, that had above a 200 batting average that series. Yes. I, I mean, I mean, I was so disappointed that Atlanta didn't um, play harder than what I had seen them play, especially going down the stretch in the month of September and then just really weird series against. I, I mean, you know, I was surprised that San Diego basically made it all the way to the NL. CS before they essentially just kind of wet the bed against 
on the field. Yeah, it's I, their, I did, the I did not, I back did not into their that. their lineup is carrying that, that team. Matchup, period. I did. I did not expect those two to match up. In the, yeah, in the it's NLC. it's not sustainable to have your lineup be carried by the seven, eight, and nine hitters, and it finally caught up to them. Yeah, but still, just you know, just trying to kind of see how this plays out here. I I, I know I kind of had mentioned this, kind of just talking about some of the um big um postseason moments during our lifetimes i just made like a really small list um myself but you know what what what, one of the really cool things i i I don't know if you i i think we had kind of talked about um that um 30 for 30 on espn you've kind of caught a few episodes for 30 for 30 right on for what which one are we talking about it's it's a ESPN series thirty for thirty. Have you? Have yeah. You, um, which which specific thirty for thirties? I've watched some thirty for thirty. I don't know which. Yeah, I just which uh, one you were talking I, about. It, it was the one that was called a Brothers in Exile. Have you ever seen that one? I don't think I've seen that one. Yeah, that, it's it's a really good one. It's about um two pitchers, Levon and Orlando Hernandez. Um, that when they um first came into the league, I think Levon started his career with the Marlins, and Orlando Hernandez went to the Yankees, but they won the world series in their first year in their major league careers in 97 and 98 when they were with them. It's, it's a must watch. I, I, I would um, advise anybody who hasn't watched that on 30 for 30 to check that out. I, I don't know if it's taped on there or not. I mean, I have YouTube TV. Yeah, and- uh, if you have ESPN plus, I believe you have access to all 30 for 30. So. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it is a must watch. I, I, I wouldn't yeah. recommend that for another must watch. We're talking about 30 for 30s with, Baseball, specifically playoff baseball, is uh, four days in October. Right, Amazing. I've seen that one with yeah. Boston. Yeah, that was that was one of that was one of my moments as well. That was Probably one of the play. the first thirty for thirties that came out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I because that I remains actually, to this day the only three zero comeback in baseball history. I I I want to wait to see you know if a team would ever accomplish that in the World Series if anybody ever. Oh, well, that would be the. One World of the greatest series. moments if, ever. If if if, if, some, if someone were to do that in the World Series, Cleveland got awesome. close to doing it. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, but you know that was one of my other ones. You know, Red Sox ending their historic streak from 1918 to 2004. White Sox ending their streak between 1917 and 2005. It, the 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 one thing I would say about kind of looking back on those two World Series, especially those years. What an NLCS that was in 2004. I mean, I was only like nine years old when that happened, but that was like Jim Edmonds and Jeff Bagwell and those guys going at it in the NLCS, uh, whoever played Boston that year. And that, that was just a wild 2004 postseason that year, especially, you know, ending with a historical moment. But that whole 2004 postseason was crazy and then of course White Sox in 2005 winning with Scott Pesednik and those guys and haven't well. done anything since then yeah period the White Sox are a weird team yeah, I mean I, I don't understand why Tony LaRusso was even higher back I mean he yeah, no, coached, he's, them, coached them in the 1980s he, and they hired him yeah. back to reverse their he fortune should have, he should have stayed like gone like just and I want to mention another moment, playoff moment. This is sure, bias. Okay. This is my favorite, my favorite World Series moment. Jorge Soler's sure. Game Six home run. That's yes. amazing. And then my favorite playoff moment is when Tyler Matzik came in with runners on second and third and yeah. no out in Game Six was, of the NLCS last year and struck out the side. That was huge. I I remember seeing that and that. I mean, you know, you talk about like a pitch that forms that Jacob DeGrom moment, just kind of, you know, getting out there on the mound and shutting them down. That's a huge momentum yep. swing. He, uh, he recently had Tommy John surgery too. So hopefully he can come back and get back to that form. Cause he was, had a bit of a disappointing year this year, but he just had Tommy John. He missed the playoffs because of that. So, 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 so he's probably going to miss most of the next yeah, year. Yeah. He won't probably. play next year. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. that stays. Yikes. Yeah. Which, Looking back on it, it's even more of a weird situation because with that appearance, the guy that gave up the runners on second and third was Luke Jackson, and he missed all of this year with Tommy John surgery. So now Tyler Matzik is missing all of next year with Tommy John. But, yeah, Tyler, Tyler Matzik is forever an Atlanta legend for that that one inning. He he could never pitch in, in the big leagues again, 
and he would be remembered in, in Atlanta for that inning. I'll even throw one more um, Atlanta Brave moment. The, 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 this this wasn't for me, but I think you know probably one of the best performances. I know Matzik was there. I mean, I was just a I wasn't even well. I, I was born in February 1995, but I mean, I don't think I watched any of the World Series when I was a baby. But just looking looking back on it, that performance by Tom Glavin though, in Game was it Game Five or Game Six? I'm not sure which game that was in the ninety five World Series, but he basically just blanked that whole Cleveland Indians lineup when they finally brought that first World Series home to Atlanta. I mean, that performance. Yeah, I remember they were showing uh, in game six last year, they would show the graphics comparing Max Freed's game to that game because Max Freed shut out the Astros in game six last year, too, after getting his ankle stepped on in the first inning. Way to bear down and just kind of do, do your accomplishment there. Probably um, yeah. one of the, a lot of the, of the best better. moments, though, is, is those teams that like barely sneak in the playoffs or like are facing elimination, like how with the Red Sox, they had to face elimination four straight games. The Braves barely snuck in with what was it, 88 wins last year. The, like, those are, those are always the best moments when those teams go and do something. Agreed. And I was kind of looking at my list as well. I got to give a, I got to give probably one of the more recent ones. Um, here back in uh, 2018 when uh, uh, Christian Yelich and Lorenzo came went toe-to-toe with Los Angeles in 2018. I so wanted the Brewers to win that series against the Dodgers that year. I mean, you know, I think both of them have really disappeared over the last few years. I mean, we were talking earlier how Christian Yelich really wasn't looking that great this year. But that one year in 2018, I thought the Brewers were destined to um, get back to the World Series after they had gotten there in 1982 and they came so close lost that series four games to three but I was pulling for them hard in that 2018 NLCS when they went toe-to-toe with Los Angeles yeah another uh mentioned some other things in the playoffs uh anything that David Freeze did for the Cardinals in that World Series was amazing yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then um in 2018, it's not even really memorable. It's just the Red Sox just what showed up, best team in the league. And they're like, we're going to show you we're the best team in the league. And just dominated. Mm-hmm. Like, well, I think they beat the – was it – did they beat the Dodgers in five four games in the World Series? Four games won. Yeah, four games won. Yeah, like yeah. it was – like they just dominated that. That Like they, they were like, we're the best team in the league in the regular season and we're going to show you we're the best team in the league in the postseason. But I, 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 I will mention this, though, as well. I, I remember after when they won that World Series, Alex Cora came under scrutiny after winning that because people were kind of going with him when he was on Houston in 20. 20- yeah, they actually fired him for a year. After they yeah. uh, after the Houston thing was discovered, Alex Cora got right. fired from the Red Sox and then hired right, right. back the next year. I, I remember when that happened. That that just kind of seemed so odd for me. And um, probably just a few more moments as well. I got to give credit to uh, – um, San Francisco, those number of years that Bruce Bochy was there from 2010 to oh, yeah. 2014. The, they won three titles in, in, what was it, five years? Three three titles in five years, 2010. it was every other year. That was a, that was a heck, heck of a run for um, Bochy there. Oh, I, how have we not mentioned the 2019 Nationals yet? Yeah, I, I was just thinking about that too with Soto and – Everybody finally bringing it home. And been Strasburg to- winning World Series MVP. Yeah. And, 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 and if I remember correctly, I think it was Howie Kendrick that won NLCS MVP. I think so. I think you're right. And I was going to even say, I think the last time they had even really ever appeared because they had never won. Because um, they didn't want a series. They didn't want a series with Bryce Harper on the team. Right. And, and especially knowing that the fact, you know, dating back to when their franchise played in Montreal with the Expos, I think the last – postseason series they basically won was in the strike short year in 1981 they won the division series but then lost the championship series that year but they never won another playoff series until that year in 2019 when they made that run so that was a 38 year absence between them and their last great moment granted it was in Montreal but it's kind of seen some of my other things on here I, I have to give it up for my grandfather, Chicago Cubs, in 2016. That oh, was yeah. Great, I don't know how we didn't mention me. that was, almost immediately. I was pulling so hard for, for them that year when they made that run. I, I, I didn't think they could come back from three games to one against Cleveland. I thought I don't Cleveland think anyone did. Series, I, I, I immediately said, 
it's done. You know, I mean, the curse of Barman and the curse of Ruth and everybody, it, it still, it still yeah. lived. But that was an incredible last three games, you know, coming back and um, getting that. And especially even that game seven, you know, with Rajay Davis tying it up to send it to extra innings, I just fell on the floor in the living room and I was like, no. Just, mm. Yeah, their decision to leave uh, Chapman out there for an extra inning was kind of confusing. That was that was weird when they um, did that. Um, yeah, probably uh, probably just kind of showing a little bit of my Mets. I know my Mets were um, disappointing this year after 101 wins, but I'm dating this all the way back to before you were born, back in 2000, when they uh, um, basically shut down Barry Bonds and the Giants in the 2000 NLDS, Benny Ibayani hitting the walk-off home run in game three, and then Bobby Jones throwing a one-hit performance to clinch that series against the Giants before the Mets played the Yankees in that World Series against um, Roger Clemens and company in 2000. I, I, I still, to this day, hate Roger Clemens for what he did in that World Series against Piazza when he when Piazza basically broke the bat in two. Clemens grabbed the bat and threw it at Mike Piazza as he was walk, running down the first baseline. And when they were talking in post-game interview, Piazza just kind of took the podium and said, like, you know, I said to him, like, you know, why'd you do that? And he's like, he really gave no response. You know, it's just like, no, it was like, and like Clement said, like, I was throwing the bat toward one of the bad boys. And I'm like, shut up. I mean, I just, I, I've hated Roger Clemens with a passion so much, especially when he testified to, Congress in 2004 made a big hoopla during the steroids era, claiming that, you know, he wasn't with Bonds and McGuire and those guys. Yeah, another moment, um, Albert Pujols' home run off of Brad Lidge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In he rushed that ball. That ball yeah. is still <laughs> – that, that ball's in space somewhere. That ball never landed. I, 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 I remember seeing – a. I, I don't know if it was – I think it was the Astros um, dugout. I remember just like, you know, as soon as that pitch was swung, they showed a thing of their thing, and they were like, oh, my God. He, he hit like that. Yeah. He hit it like that hard. It was like he hit it way above the railroad tracks. As the, um, yeah, that, that thing left the stadium. Like That, that, I mean, that, that ball a, and uh, Jorge Soler's home run last yeah. year were pretty much identical. Like those were crushed. Straight out of – moon shots, whatever you want to call them. You know, they were huge momentum swings for both of them. Probably probably another um, interesting moment. This was back when I was a young kid as well, but I remember kind of seeing, you know, highlights of this one when Anaheim made um, some late game heroics in game two and game six of the 2002 World Series. Of course, everybody talks about that game six comeback. Giants could have easily won that series. I think they were up like four to nothing or five to nothing entering the, I think it was four nothing. They were up in the eighth inning and um, the angels in the bottom of the eighth scored like five runs to sneak out um, of game six to take it to game seven to win their only world series in franchise history with Troy Gloss and Percival and those guys when they won it in 02. It's probably another moment I remember. Yep, they need to get it together and get back there. They need to stop wasting us generational talent they have. You know, Shohei Itani and those guys. And I'll even say this as well. I don't know if you um, saw this or not, but I think it was a few days ago on ABC News they were interviewing uh, um, Tyler Skaggs' uh, um, mother and his uh, um, widow that um, he left behind. But they were talking about um, sort of, you know, how to represent his life, but they were also talking about Eric K, who was uh, um, responsible for giving him the things. They played, I guess, a thing of him in prison. I don't know exactly the verbiage he said, but he basically, I think, called Skaggs like a POS. I mean, and he called him that. I'm like, yeah, I saw that. How stupid of you. I mean, you're the one who was responsible for his – I think that was the main reason that they – because they – I think – he said that before he got sentenced. I think that's the main reason that they sent him to prison was because he showed no remorse. No, show no remorse. No yeah. remorse. It's just, it's just kind of like what we were just talking about earlier about Kyrie Irving making his comments as well. Just you know, showing no remorse or just saying you know you can't 
judge me by what I do or my statements. And I'm, it, what I'll even say to you is this. I, I know we kind of – I always try to basically avoid politics on this. I never like playing politics, especially talking about sports. But my question to you is this really briefly, and we'll probably just wrap this up after here. Do you think superstars are really players – um, are really kind of getting too much power to their heads right now, kind of basically acting like as their own GMs or how their teams are being built, like Brady or LeBron James or Duran and Irving. Do you think it's just kind of getting out of control? Uh, I think it depends on, like, the certain person. It's not like everyone. Like, obviously, like, certain players are doing that. And just to completely switch topics, Jeremy Pena just took the lead with, for the Astros with a home run. But yeah, back to that. It's like it's it's just the certain few people there that are that have like a history of doing stuff like that, or like have gotten it to the point where they're like, "Well, I can do whatever I want," and it's shown that no one's going to do anything about it. So, I, I, I'm just kind of hoping that you know, especially after what you just said with the Nets suspending Irving, and you know, just kind of seeing how that plays out you know i'm just kind of just hoping that you know people just i think need to start waking up a little bit and just starting to think about what's happened i know the whole covid pandemic has really kind of messed with people's emotions and everything but i just think you know a lot of people just kind of need to wake up out of this dream and just kind of say you know what this is the new reality that we're in right now and we need to try and fix it a little bit here but um but other than that, though, I think we've um, kind of, you know, really kind of touched base with what I did. But um, if you uh, wanted to um, mention something else before we uh, um, wrap this up, go ahead. I think that's probably about it. I don't – I mean, I, I said it earlier uh, when we were talking about college football. Georgia's going to beat Tennessee, no doubt about it. So yeah, I'll end on I, that. No, I, I, I'm really hoping that the SEC I, – I, I, This I is going to look bad on me if, if that – doesn't happen, but I don't have a doubt in my mind that George is going to beat them at home. The, the way that I see that game almost going down between Georgia and Tennessee is I think, you know, whoever really kind of gets either the last possession or who basically dictates the control of the game is going to win it because, you know, Tennessee oh, George is going to dictate the control of the game. Tennessee doesn't control the game. They just go down the field, score really fast. I, I, mean, I think Georgia is fourth in time of possession and Tennessee is in like the 80s. Yeah, I just, I mean, the way that I see it as well, it's just kind of seeing, you know, how um, Tennessee is kind of playing like what the Houston Oilers used to do, like that run and shoot style offense yeah. they had in the 90s and just kind of seeing, you know, how Georgia is kind of really just controlling the tempo and the pace there. I think if, if, if Georgia controls the ball for over 35 minutes in that game, they win it. Which I, I think they will. There was yeah, a game yeah. last year, I, I still remember this because it's hilarious. Tennessee won a game last year where they had the ball for 13 minutes. <laughs> wow. So they're capable of doing it, but, like, when you're playing a defense like Georgia, they, you can't have the ball for 13 minutes and put up that many points. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just kind of just looking as well, just really quickly on some of the other games I might be watching on a, um, Saturday or just probably just really just calling out really quick. I, I've been impressed about – um number 19th ranked Tulane. They kind of um, surprised me this year. Especially also this week. Kind of, see, kind of seeing the teams that, you know, are still going to be in the All-American Football Conference when Charlotte and those other teams move in. Tulane certainly has made um, their chance run. Um, just kind of just seeing just really briefly on any others that just kind of popped out to me. Hopefully Syracuse can right the ship against Pittsburgh. Um Penn State will win against Indiana or Oregon. I, I, I'll say this: I would, I would love. Oregon's to see, gotten a lot better since they got they have, blown out by Georgia. Yeah, I, yeah, I would love to see Oregon play against either USC or UCLA. I mean, you know, I would love to see Oregon um, beat them before, or, or, or really, I, I would say beat them after they announced that they were moving to the Big Ten conference this year. Just kind of Oregon reclaiming their throne and saying, you know, we're still in control here. Yeah, 17th ranked North Carolina plays Virginia. That'll be a win for them. I actually need to head out. So if you want to 
if you yeah. want to yeah, yeah, uh, keep go going on your end or if we just wrap it up yeah. real quick. Let's go, let's go ahead and wrap this up here. But okay. thank you all for joining us here um, tonight, though, for the 18th episode of 100 Years of the NFL. And hopefully we will see you all down the road. As I mentioned, my cousin Sam, hopefully we'll probably try and catch up around Thanksgiving. But, you know, it's going to be an interesting final month here of college football and really seeing how the NFL postseason plays out. But this is Alex, Chris, and Billy McGee signing off for the 18th episode of 100 years of the NFL and we hope you all have a good night. Have a good night everybody and we will see you all next time.